Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're going to wrap up chapter 2, which is our chapter on uh, doing a hello world example in D7 programming language that we're looking at. And we're going to close off by sort of putting our example programs side by side and talking about them a little bit. And then we're going to kind of go and do like sort of a brief issue of the languages we're looking at. Um, there are too many programming languages out there. And so I couldn't include all of them to compare here. And I cannot include all of them in when we go sort of look at who influence who. So we're going to sort of see how the languages we are playing with got some of their features and or inspire them. And then we're going to see other languages that they in influence some of them are on our list and some of them not on our list with that in mind let's go look at our example programs first we're going to look at c our c example program and c is going to be the oldest language on our list and we can see um just with uh, a few lines we can print hello world and if you never programmed before this might look like a lot but if you've been programming um, it's not too bad. You can really start with line seven and say, well, okay, what we want our objective is to print hello world. And so what do we really need? Well, we need a function um, that's provided by the language in a library that is going to do the work for us, which is going to print our string. But in order for us to have access to that function, we, and proper syntax, we included it, uh, include a header file called stdio.h. Now, technically speaking, with the older style C, I mean, now the compiler is much stricter, you can actually get away with not including that file at all and <laughs> really just write in your main program without C. So you could get rid of the line three and it would still work. And the reason why that doesn't include the source or the implementation of that printf function, that comes from the standard library and that is linked to your program anyway. We're not going to talk too much about compiling and linking really, but remember that's how C is a compiled language. And so it only really matters when you go to link it with the library that provides the implementation for printf or whatever else you're calling, that it really matters. So for C, you really don't need 9.3. But for good programming practice, you want to say, oh, I'm using the printf that's defined in stdioh. And if for some reason your ID can help you out in when you go for use printf, if you don't use it properly, it can say, hey, it can flag it and say, hey, this is not how it was defined, okay? Again, I'm using the word defined there to, for a very specific reason. And we're gonna see that later on as we start um, play with C and C++. The next language is um, our C++. And this is one way of doing C++ that is more C-like. And the only thing you're really doing is using a pre-compiled header and you're using the C++ C outway um, operator to um, put something out on the screen. And we saw when we were looking at C++ that you can actually include C STDIO, right? Which is just STDIO to pre-compile error with C in front of it and actually still use printf. And so the only difference between your really your C and your C++ program would have been that one line on line three on whether you include um, C STDIO or IO stream. But here we're doing it the C++ way and we include IO stream and we're using um, C out the operator. And we're saying that out that is available in the namespace from standard template library, which is um, called STD. And we actually have a second example of C++. And here our C++ example is actually using a class. So it went around the way of creating a Hello World program by saying, I'm actually going to create a class that has a method um, say called say hello. And now, um, but it's a static method, so I don't really need to create an instance or object of that class first before using it. I can just call the cl um, hello method on that class. And we see the same thing when we go to our Java example. Um, we have a package for it, again, optional for us to put stuff in a package in Java, but good programming practice, you want to put it in a package. And in Java, we see it all. Your main function cannot be a standalone global function like we see in C++ example, or even in C, but your main function must be part of a class. And since it's part of a class, you know, the Java runtime needs to be able to know 
where to start executing. And it does that by you specifying the class that you want to run. And then it looks in that class for a function with this signature, um, you know, public static void. And so by saying public means I can call it from outside this class and static means that all the, now your runtime, your Java runtime can just call main from that class and launching your application. The next one is our Python and Python seems to just throw the baby with the bathwater or maybe it didn't. Um, usually that tends to mean that if you have something bad, you tend to just go too far. Um, the reason I say that is because Python, as we'll see later, um, decided it's not even going to use things like curly braces to group blocks, statement blocks. It's going to use indentation. For me, this is my opinion. I think that's terrible. I, hate, I think the idea of using just indentation to say um, what level um, of statement you're executing is really bad. But um, again, that's my opinion. And so a number of people have program, program in Python, they love it. And so obviously it doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> um, but simplicity, you cannot knock simplicity. One statement, I want to print, print method. Here's a string, print it. And not only that, we don't care about a semicolon. We don't need it. Get rid of it. Okay. Um, and you're going to see this with a lot of other things. Python tries to simplify and just make it really easy and fast for you to get stuff done. Now, everything comes at a cost. As you move across the screen here from left to right and then towards the bottom, our languages are getting a little bit slower. The only exception there is going to be Go, um, which brings us back some speed. But we're talking about Python. It is not a terribly, terribly slow language, but for the more stuff you do with it, it's going to kind of get slower. Uh, makes certain things very easy to do, like manipulating strings, working with arrays and collections and dictionaries and all that stuff. But again, if you trying to just do everyday sort of programming with it, it pretty much works. If you're trying to do system programming with it, no can do, okay? Even Java is not gonna be considered a system programming language. Um, just not appropriate for that space. The next language is um, Groovy. Groovy looks a lot like Python, doesn't it? You know, there's a print print function and you can just say what you wanna print. Um, again, it gets rid of all the ceremony of, I wanna write a function and I gotta write a class and and all this other stuff and I have to import this or include this. Give, Groovy already imports a number of things that classes from Java that you'd wanna use. And you'll see that when we start writing more complex Groovy Pro applications. But again, pretty straightforward and very simple. The thing I like with Groovy is that most of your Java code will compile by Groovy. And I'll show you at the end, or I'll take the code that we compile, this very same code that we compile into a class and I'll run it. Um, which is not true of like the Scala code. Um, our Scala code looks exactly like the Groovy code. I mean, exactly, it's the same thing. And it's gonna make sense when we start looking at which language influenced which, and you'll see that so, you know, Groove, Scala came after Groovy. So the guys who did Scala weren't ignorant of the fact that Groovy existed and it run on the same JVM that they intend to run on and taking some lessons from there. But they also intend to solve a different set of problems and they wanted to be more in the math space and so on. And so they sort of made a language that's more mathematically correct, we should, I can say. But anyway, and basically they tried to avoid some of the side uh, effects that you'd get from C, C++ and some of the other language. And they start, uh, sort of tried to make a language that was stateless. So uh, that's a little bit confusing, but we'll talk a little bit more about it later. And you'll see, I think, when they decide to try and make um, Scala this language that really didn't have any side effect, they end up coming up with two hierarchies of classes for things that you want to do. So things that cannot be changed, like things that are immutable, and then things that would need to change. We'll see more of that. To me, that had more complications to the language. Certainly, at the syntax doesn't help. But per again, personal opinion, it doesn't really matter. If you're getting work done with Scala, good for you, great. Glad you found the language that you like. Finally is my, one of my true love. I love C, I love C++, I love Groovy, but I also absolutely love Go. I think it's sort of a return to the C style of programming language where it's simple, um, again, but the syntax is not as crazy 
As you're going to see later on, C++, the syntax can get hairy. Just like Scala, they both need to go back and revisit their syntax and the idea about a modern language is ju just being too cryptic. Um, <laughs> they really need to. Um, I'm hoping that with Go on the market and a language like Rust, that when they look at C++ and how to extend it, they're actually going to clean up a few things. And they've been trying, trying honestly. Um, but it's still a lot more work to be done there. But anyway, um, Go. More than what you have to do for Python, Groovy, and Scala, but forget a simple hello world going, but don't let that fool you. Go is a system programming language in the sense that it's like C and C++. It's not even in the same category as Java because while I think Go is actually more fun to program in than Java, it actually I'll give you the kind of performance that you get from, you know, you get better performance in Java and you kind of get almost the same performance as C, C++. Can't really quite get it there because there's a runtime, but whatever. Um, I still write a trade in terms of if you ask me to write a system, some system code, and you say, well, do you want to do it in C or C++? I'll definitely say, no, I want to do it in Go. And only in the places where I absolutely need the fastest piece of code and really be, need to control every aspect of that application, I'll turn to maybe C++, maybe. I said maybe because I'll still probably rather write that small piece in C. And again, I, I still love C++, right? Um, and then if it really needs to be super fast, I'll just say, let me just do it in assembly language. Let me just do it in assembly language. Um, it's not a language I've included for a comparison because it is so different from all the rest that to get a simple example like printing hello world going, it would be so much um, involved and so much to do. So decided to leave it off. But anyway, there you have it. Our seven languages, two examples of Hello World and C++. But other than that, um, you know, this is it. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do this, put them side by side for all the examples we have coming up. But for as long as I can do it, I'll do it. The reason why, because some of the examples are going to get too long and they are not going to fit on one page that you can see it this easily. So uh, that's why I wouldn't do it. But you're going to have all the code there that you can just go through and thing. But at the end of each chapter, I'll try to wrap up and just summarize what we know and, you know, across the languages. All right. So now let's look at the languages and how they came about, maybe possibly by looking at which language I influence on them, which language they influence. So you can see, like I said, C came out in 1972. It's a 44-year-old um, around this time. And so that's, that's, that's a long time. And it's influenced by this language which came before it, pretty much B, C, P, L, and some other languages that were on the Unix type system they are using at the time. And um, I think the, no, I could be wrong. Um, this one was probably written in assembly language, or Unix, a Multix was probably written in like B, C, P, L, and assembly, and then they developed C and then wrote Unix in C. But I can't remember the exact history, but anyway. Um, it was a Unix-like system and they had language like B and CPL and so on and Algo and Fortran and so on. And then what Fortran did was show how you can really write this sort of language that was mostly portable sort of. Again, when I say portable, people are going to laugh uh, if you know these languages that really seems portable. But yeah, it's pretty much portable. It's much more portable than assembly language. And it's interesting that you can see C is influenced by assembly language there. Um, you can really take C code I haven't shown it in this video, but one of these days I'm gonna show it in one of the section. And you can take it and just compile and generate like C assembly language, okay? And um, you may be able to do it with C++ also, where you can, you know, set, tell it to compile down and generate, not even generate, compile, but you know, spit out assembly, the corresponding assembly language. Um, for the other languages, it's gonna be a little bit harder, probably maybe even impossible. Um, but look at um, the languages that C influenced. Of course, C++. That was the intent. C++ was meant to be a better C. Of course, uh, you can argue whether it is or not. There was a brief time when there was some language called C++. I looked at it. It was, you know, it came out after C++ and they felt that they could do a better C++, but that didn't go anywhere. Microsoft got in the game with C Sharp. Their language is still around. I tried learning C Sharp and then I gave up. 
I've, there are a number of languages on this list I'm going to probably mention that I tried learning. It wasn't because it's too hard or anything, but after I play with a language for like a weekend, I kind of know whether I want to keep programming it. Um, sometimes future uh, years later, I end up going back to the language, maybe because of work or whatever other thing is happening, or the language might have developed or something. Usually because of work, I'll go back to it. Um, that was certainly the case with Java, but whatever. Um, Objective-C. Um, big proponent of Objective-C was Apple, and they used that in like the Raspberry aspects operating system and other operating system, Next Step OS, and so on. Um, D. D is still around, and it's probably getting more popular now, but D is a language I played with for a very long time and I even used to push it. And I would still say it, though. I haven't looked at it recently, so I can, honestly can I say whether well, you should learn D or not, but at the time, it was a nice cleanup of C++. Um, I would say D is influenced more like C++ and by Ruby. Um, of course, Go, C, Go, C influence Go, Java, Rust. Today, Rust is getting a lot of attention as a better C and maybe even a better C++ in a way. I don't think Rust is really object-oriented, so it's more probably more closely compared to, if anything, Rust is trying to be the true successor to C. Okay, like says, hey, we love C, but let's just take out the bad parts or the troublesome parts. And we don't have to be as crazy as C++, right? If I had to give my take on Rust. Again, I haven't spent much time on it. Uh, one of these days, I'm probably going to look at it since it's so close to C. Like I said, I love C so much that, yeah, you want to get me to learn a programming language, just tell me how it's pretty much C. Like, and you pretty much got me. Um, Verilog, which, you know, um, it's not really quite a programming language, it's got a hardware description language, but again, still influenced by C. So many other languages that are influenced by C. I didn't put on any scripting languages on here, like CSH or whatever, but like C shell, but there's so many other languages that are influenced by C. I'm telling you, C is a real, you know, powerhouse here. Um, C++, 34 years, been around a long time, influenced by Aida, Algo 68 and C, of course, and Simula. Um, that's where you got C, got C plus was got its object oriented um, features basically because it was influenced by Simula. Um, and you now you'll see something even more crazy is that which language C plus was influenced? Ada. Well, that's because Ada is wrong. C plus was got some um, ideas from there and go, hmm, I like this part, let me do it better. And then when Ada 95 came out after C plus was, they like, hey, there's some nice thing that C++ did. Why don't we put that back in our language? And so you're going to see this happen where one language influence another and then the next iteration of the language that was used as an influence um, takes some features from um, the language that influenced to be created, if that makes any sense, but whatever. And there's C++, um, C Sharp again. Microsoft, when they did C Sharp, they didn't only take less than an idea from C, but they also took less than an idea from C++. Um, C99, which is still C, but it's the C that came out after C++. They're like, hey, we like some of the stuff that C++ is doing. Bam, let's borrow it. And of course, D, like I said, is not only influenced by C, but also specifically, I think, more C++. D really was, in my opinion, an uh, intention to make a better C++. That's what they call it. D is like what comes after C is like D. And if you don't really know, why is the C++? That's because there's this plus plus operator in C that's very, very popular for increment, which is the thing that comes next. And also when you look at C minus minus, they, they're doing a play on that C operator. Um, and the guys for D is just saying like, we're li quite literally after C. <laughs> yeah. um, and of course, C++ influenced Java. Um, I can remember there was this news group in which uh, C++ programmers would meet. And guess who was in there? A bunch of um, Java people saying, hey, come check out our language. And some people weren't happy, but anyway. And this video is getting super long. And so I'm not gonna keep going through all of this because I think I'm gonna be here talking for an hour. I just realized the time. But um, know that how, you know, no language stand on its own and languages keep influencing each other down at the bottom of the list, we see Go is our new entrance in the um, fairly new, but even Go is having a huge impact in terms of the discussion of what languages should do today. And it's more than just the syntax. I think Go, of, of all the other languages on the list, uh, whether they're influenced or influenced by, very few of them has this one feature that I think Go has, 
but Google was influenced, if you look there, by CSP, um, concurrent uh, sequential processes. But very few languages have this idea of we'll build into the language the ability that it should really scale out very easily to multiple processors. Now you can say, well, oh, no, that's not true. Java came with threads. Well, Java thread programming is a pain and you can do multi-threaded programming in C++ also, or even C. They all come up with Java, C and C++ uses library. Java is sort of built into the language, yes, but still they are painful. I think Go really makes this easy. And of course it got it from CSP, but that's one of the things. And because of some of the things that Go did, I'm not gonna be surprised if we were to revisit this list in 10, 15 years, you're not gonna see that C++ borrows some things from Go and Scala and Groovy or Java. Um, so I think good candidates for who are gonna borrow from Go, I think is gonna be C++ and Java um, and even Scala, right? I'm gonna borrow from, from Go, but we shall see. All right, um, I said that I'm going to show how to run um, our Groovy code, but before I do that, if you kinda wanna see a little bit more about how languages influence each other when they showed up and where they got influenced from, um, do a search for history of programming languages and you'll see a number of charts and graphs and so on, but one might look like this. And so that gives you a little bit, and this only goes up to 2001. So you're not gonna see um, some of your more newer um, languages on there. So when it comes to um, running your Groovy code, this is one of the things you can do, and you can do it very easily, is if you can find where your Groovy library was installed. And here I'm using Brew, I use Brew to install my Groovy. So I'm gonna say Brew list, and it's gonna show me where all the files that was part of the Groovy installation. I'm going to look for the Groovy jar, and this is like basically most of what ship with Groovy is included. And then I'm going to use that in my as my class pack because it's just a jar. We haven't talked about jar yet. Jars are how you package a number of classes. Remember, we took a source file, compile it to a class, or we take Java, compile it to a class, or we take Scala, compile it to a class, and then now we package those classes into jars. And now I can use um, the Java um, command to say, hey, create a virtual um, environment VM for me, a JVM, and here's the class bar to some jars or some classes packaged in a jar including look at my own directory here, my current directory, that's what, hence why that period. And what I want you to be able to do is run um, this thing I'm gonna call hello. And it just goes into, and again, Groovy makes it easy and provide the entry point for us so we don't have to. All right, a lot here to unpack. It's sort of, is meant to be just a tour. So don't worry if you don't understand everything. Hopefully you'll start to understand a little bit more, but this is not a tutorial on these languages. So this is really to try to show you and maybe get you interested in some of the language if you don't know about them. And then if you do, it's sort of just a fun way of comparing your language to other languages. All right. Um, again, follow me on Twitter, Straversity1, um, Instagram, Straversity, at Straversity. Twitter is at Straversity1. Twitter is at Straversity. Um, and thanks for your time. Appreciate it. See you in the very next video. Take care. Have a great day.